We can get started. Um, welcome again. My name is Tom Metzloff. I'm a professor here, and we have a wonderful panel. We uh, met beforehand and decided that we were going to try to avoid the everybody talk for 15 minutes and then uh, there's really no time for questions and comments. Uh, I'm also going to be sort of of the people by sitting there and not up there with the, the panelists and pop in from time to time to ask and frame a question. I will also encourage anyone in the audience to uh, join in in the questioning. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to be a very interactive session. Our topic is well known and our panelists is, are very well suited to address it. It deals with the prosecution, the prosecutors and the media. Uh, we have three people who are or have been prosecutors. Uh, we also agreed to do very minimalist uh, uh, sort of introductions. It's in your book. The one thing I will say for Loretta Lynch Hargrove, if you're looking under H's, you will not find it. It's in the L's. So it's Loretta Lynch. So if you haven't had a chance, please do that. A former pros federal prosecutor, Marsha Goodenough, for, uh, assistant uh, district attorney from Mecklenburg County. Uh, our graduate, former civil procedure student of mine, Calm Conley, who's a U.S. attorney in Delaware. I always love it when some of my students are actually doing real law uh, under the sort of uh, the medical adage, first do no harm, I must not have gotten in their way too much. So it's great to see it. And, and then uh, Professor uh, Cassidy, who has written very much on the field and has a paper in your materials. Uh, Professor Mosteller also has a paper in his materials. I'd like to start with this question. In some ways, uh, the paper that uh, Professor Cassidy and Mosteller have deal with uh, In Re Nifong. Uh, we definitely do not want this conference to be limited to that, but in some ways some of the reasons we're here were inspired by those events. And so let's just start with that question. We had a case in Durham, everyone knows about it, infamous, famous, whatever you want to describe it, and we had a prosecutor who for a period of three weeks was saying lots of things on TV. Uh, everybody remembers certain quotable quotes. Uh, I have not yet put together the video montage of all the different statements. They're not all available. Uh, some of them have been shown in disciplinary hearings and the like. But what is sort of, we're not far enough away to really answer this question definitively, but we have people here who can, I think, think about it. What is the message that's learned from that period of time, that, that series of events with Mike Nifong. Because I remember giving one of the first sort of, in this very classroom, a panel about what was right and wrong. And there were some things that, you know, I said, looking under the rules, maybe it's okay. He asked some people to come forward. If some people were there, I want to hear from you. And he may not have said it in the way I would have liked. But those are things that are anticipated within the rules. We have a very complicated rule with things that are presumptively okay, things that are presumptively not okay. As I've traveled around the country uh, this summer interviewing people for my documentaries, I've talked to several prosecutors, Mike Ramsey, who, who was involved in the medical marijuana case that went to the Supreme Court. They all make a point of sort of saying, I'm sorry, you know, if, if, once they find out you're from Duke, they, that just shouldn't have happened that way. So there's a real sort of need to, to say we're not all like that. Uh, but I'm wondering if there's a flip side to that question, too. So I would like everybody, and maybe we'll start just on our end uh, uh, with Ms. Lynch, too, to just sort of give us some reactions to how do we begin to understand lessons learned uh, or perhaps lessons overlearned from uh, the Nifong episode. Ms. Lynch. Thanks, Tom. Um, what is, is an interesting case, and there's so many things that are still coming from that. I approached it from the perspective of a former prosecutor Obviously, I'm here seeing a hand. Is that a volume? Volume. Volume. Okay. Not sure if this will if this will help. Um, okay, great. So I approached it from the view of a former prosecutor, but also someone who grew up in Durham, and I'm very familiar with sort of both sides of the community. And and there is a bit of a community divide whenever there's a a, a large campus in town. But I think that one of the things that we look at from the knife on case is, is how do you find that balance as a prosecutor between how you deal with the press, since that is the focus of this conference, between obviously things that should not be said, but, obviously the, but also the very real responsibilities that prosecutors have to interact with the press. Um, the press has an important role to play in, in a prosecutor's function in terms of informing the public and what's going on, um, and in terms of, as you mentioned, getting people to come forward, but also in terms of um, being accountable. It's one of the ways, not the only way, it's not even the most important way, but it's one of the ways in which a prosecutor is accountable to the community that they serve, whether they are elected 
or appointed. My office had a practice of issuing press releases after indictments that were, that were fairly formulaic. Some people do press conferences that again can be formulaic. But you have a situation where um, the press is not always the enemy. Now, again, there, there are many, many times when everyone goes overboard, both prosecutors and press. But I think it illustrates the need for balance, the need to look to find where is that balance, and also the need for continual training of young prosecutors and offices in how to interact with the press. Um, there was, again, this is only from the outside looking in, there seemed to be, have been a stunning lack of clarity in what could and couldn't be said um, by the prosecutor's office there. So I think those are some of the first lessons that we, that we learned from that is the need for further study and the need for, for better training and the need to find that balance. Um, also, I will tell you again that as a former prosecutor, one of the interesting issues is that the media seemed to have become part of the story in that the media coverage obviously fueled the subsequent actions against uh, D.A. Naifong when, as we've been discussing on the panel, many of the substantive problems that he presents in terms of violations of substantive federal criminal procedural law were so much more serious and so much more egregious that every prosecutor who learned, for example, that exculpatory DNA evidence had been withheld, everyone just shuddered in their boots at that. Um, and, and initially, the comments that were made, while inflammatory, were not what set, for most prosecutors, the nails on the chalkboard reaction um, to the overall case. The lesson that I think should be learned that I do not think has been learned nor ever will be learned is that a criminal defendant has a right to be tried in a courtroom and the media does not have a right to try them in the paper. I don't know that that will ever be learned. Um, I wish it would be learned. I wish that the parties to criminal cases would try their cases where they should be trying them. The aftermath of this is three young men who now have been um, declared innocent certainly weren't um, perceived by the media or this country as being innocent. They received death threats. All kinds of things happened to them because of this public's insatiable desire to know everything, whether it's been confirmed or not, whether it's true or not, and the right that they think that they have a right to know instantly what the evidence is. I'm not saying that the media and the public doesn't have a right to access to our courts. I'm saying they have a right to the access to our courts when the case is tried in our courtrooms. Um, well, the lesson I learned, I don't think it's one that everybody would learn, is, um, and it's from um, a prosecutor's perspective. I, you know, when I heard Hodding Carter's remarks this morning, and I think a number of the remarks uh, by, by various panelists, um, because my gut reaction is that they really don't see the world the way I do. I mean, I'm a true believer that 99.9% .9 of the assistant U.S. attorneys in the country and the U.S. attorneys in the country uh, do follow uh, Justice Sutherland's words in, in Berger against the United States. They do believe that the United States uh, does not uh, accomplish justice by counting convictions or arrests. Uh, they believe that in, in, in the way the words, are, I guess, are inscribed in the rotunda down in the main justice building, that the government wins its case whenever justice is done, its citizens in the courts. That's, that's what I believe, and I, I'm just, uh, it'd be very hard to convince me otherwise. So the lesson I got from Naifong was that um, not everybody plays by those rules. And uh, I mean, I tend to be very skeptical when I read in the press attacks on a prosecutor, having been unfairly attacked by defense attorneys before, uh, and having, um, having to recognize that as a United States attorney, I'm limited by the rules in responding to those attacks. And that's the way the system works, and, and I think that's the way it should work. Um, so as I say, I take what I, I, what I took from it as a prosecutor is that there really are uh, a few folks out there who do not abide by the rules. And I didn't have to rely on press accounts of Mr. Naifong's behavior, I was able to see uh, through video, uh, you know, his actual words to uh, to audiences, in particular the university audience down here that he held a press conference in front of, and I was, um, I mean, I was shocked at what he said. I found it very hard to believe that a, a, that a prosecutor, let alone a career prosecutor, could say the things he did. I was embarrassed, and um, 
and uh, I realize that we're, we're not all perfect. There are, there are bad apples out there. That's the lesson I took from it. Well, as I, as I say in my paper, I think that in regards to the prosecutor and, um, and speech to the media, I think that there are actually more lessons not learned from the Nifong case than there were lessons learned. Uh, and I say that because his conduct in failing to disclose exculpatory evidence, the so-called Brady violation, uh, and in lying to the court, the so-called candor violation, um, were so egregious that he was going to be disbarred anyway with or without improper statements to the media. Uh, and I take it by the end of the hearing, he knew that, and that's why he waived his right of appeal and didn't challenge on appeal. But in my view, some of the, the statements that he made to the media that he was charged with violating the North Carolina disciplinary canons for were actually permissible. And if they weren't permissible, if the North Carolina State Bar Disciplinary uh, Authority had, had construed the rule uh, to prohibit them, then the rule is unconstitutional. I think many of his statements were highly inflammatory and improper, clearly improper. I think the statement about a cross burning, likening it to a cross burning was, was improper. The criticism of uh, suspects for lawyering up was clearly improper. Uh, clearly you cannot make false statements to the media. The statement that they may have worn a condom to explain the DNA evidence was known to him to be false. So that was misleading in violation of the disciplinary rules. Um, so I think that those are all statements that were improper. But there are many statements uh, that he made that I think are entirely consistent with a prosecutor's uh, responsibilities as a public official. I think saying that he was appalled by the, the events and that the uh, city of Dur Durham wouldn't tolerate this kind of conduct uh, is a permissible con comment. I think that his statement that the victim's um, uh, mental state and uh, demeanor following the attack were consistent with a sexual assault, I think, was a permissible conduct comment. I think his statement that the victim was able to identify one of her attackers without, I without naming the attacker was a permissible comment under the disciplinary rules. And I think that the North Carolina Disciplinary Board painted with too broad a brush in mixing those two types of comments together, finding them all impermissible. Uh, and they didn't really discuss the nuances of the rule. There are lots of nuances of 3.6 and 3.8 F that have yet to be clarified since Gentile. And I was personally hoping that Naifong might clarify them. But by agreeing to be disbarred and waiving his right to appeal, we've lost the ability to have an appellate court decision in North Carolina on those issues. And I would also just add that I don't think that uh, uh, Gentile is the last word on the subject of attorney speech, especially for elected district attorneys. Uh, people act as if this 1991 decision uh, where the court upheld a standard of substantial likelihood of material prejudice to a proceeding uh, is the final word on the permissibility of regulating attorney speech, overlooking the Supreme Court's 2002 decision in uh, Minnesota versus White. In Minnesota versus White, the Supreme Court was faced with a, a canon of judicial ethics that prohibited candidates for judicial office from announcing their position uh, on legal issues. And the court struck it down. And the court said that if we are going to elect judges, if, if the state is going to decide that election is its means of selecting judges, they can't gag these, peop these candidates and deprive the public of knowing their views on issues. I think the same could be said of elected district attorneys. Uh, and I would note that uh, Justice Rehnquist, um, uh, who, who voted for the substantial likelihood of material prejudice standard in Gentile, uh, voted with the majority in, in white. And in white, there was no, uh, there was no uh, language of membership of the, with the bar comes with certain uh, responsibilities and we're free to limit the, the speech more, more broadly of members of the bar than members of the public. There was none of that with elected judges in white. They said a candidate is a candidate is a candidate and political speech is at the core of the First Amendment. So I think had the disciplinary committee looked more closely at uh, North Carolina Disciplinary Rule 3.6 and 3.8F, they would have found some constitutional infirmities in it as applied to Mr. Nifong. And that's not to excuse his behavior. His behavior was reprehensible. But I think that there were certain nuances of his speech that 
that deserved better attention. Let me jump in there because I think we need to come back to some interesting points there. The uh, Minnesota versus White case maybe is not one that people are familiar with. Actually, we did another documentary on that one. It's a fun case. Um, for those of you interested in that, uh, the person ran for office was a guy named Greg Wurstel who put up cut out pictures of cows all over the place. And, and uh, it's, it, it's a fun case. But it is an important one. And the connection point is, is important here. Let me ask this question. The, most of Mr. Nifong's comments were made during his primary election. Uh, that may be part of the motivation of why he did what he did. Certainly, the disciplinary uh, uh, committee hearing found a, a connection between his losing in the polls and his decision to kind of go public on these things. But let's, let's take it out of the specifics of a, spe a case. What if running for uh, district attorney in, D in Durham County, uh, someone says, I'm going to be tough on Duke defendants and kids. We know we've got problems in Trinity Park. We've got party problems and noise problems, and I have seen, as Mr. Nifong, I think, would say if we could go back there, I have seen lots of Duke defendants get off the hook uh, that they shouldn't get off of. And if I am elected, I will be, I will treat them as fairly as every other defendant, and I'm not going to give them, you know, any special pre uh, privileges or protections. Is that okay? I mean, that, that, that's the kind of, you know, pure kind of core political speech. I'm running on a get tough on Duke kids campaign. Um, okay or not okay? Yeah, what, is, what is the context of this election? And, uh, and, 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 and what does that mean in terms of what district attorney should be able to say? You know, I think that's one of those, those examples. I, I think it's a great example because um, you, you can be specific yet very, very general. But it's an example of where, where someone may be able to say something, but the issue is should they? And uh, I'm not sure how effective that would be in, in a campaign in the first place. But certainly, in, if any group is ever singled out, they're ultimately going to have an equal protection claim down the road. But certainly, if, there's a, if, if someone were to say, I'm running for DA of whatever county, and um, you know, I, I promise that I'm going to equally review all cases that come before me, um, and I am promise that I'm going to be equally tough on everyone that comes before me, to me, that would be acceptable. And I think a lot of it, though, is the context in which you live. And I think that prosecutors do not work in a vacuum, particularly elected prosecutors. But none of, none of us do or, or did. And you have a community that you're responsive to. And what you're trying to do, at least what you, what you should be trying to do, is look at the issues in that community and how do you best address them. And to the extent that there might, in fact, be a perception or even a reality that certain classes of defendants get dealt with differently by an office, whether it is along racial or educational or gender grounds, that is something that, is, that should be addressed and I think can be validly addressed in a number of ways. If it's as clumsy as, okay, I'm going to go after all the Duke students, that's a difficult thing to justify. Certainly, whenever we hear veiled references by certain candidates, I'm going to go after all the black people, you know, that's, uh, that's recognized as completely inappropriate and, and, uh, and something that can't be said. But, you know, if you have a situation where there is a perception in the community of unequal justice, even if it's wrong, you know, that's something that a prosecutor has a responsibility to address. How they address it, the substance of how they address it, then takes you into a, into a dialogue of how are they actually going to do their job. But I think, depending upon how you, how you phrase that, uh, if a prosecutor were to say, look, I'm going to make sure that every case that comes before me gets reviewed equally, because flip it, you want to say, as a prosecutor, in any victim that comes before me is going to be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of who the, the alleged attacker is. You know, because maybe you want to deal with the perception by black victims that they get ignored. So I, th I think a lot of it is how you say it. But the underlying sentiment can, I think, can be very appropriately said. I agree with everything she said. I think that there are appropriate ways to do it. I do have to differ with Professor Cassidy. I don't think that the remarks that Mr. Nifong made were appropriate. You can't talk about a specific case being appalling and saying it happened. You were expressing an opinion on the guilt or innocence of that person. You were saying that it did occur when you cannot. Nothing wrong at all with the candidate saying that I think a rape is appalling, that crime is appalling. I think if somebody running for office has to tell the voters that he thinks rape is appalling, he's probably already in a lot of trouble <laughs> if they don't understand that already. Um, but to specifically comment on a pending case or to say I'm going to go after Duke students, nothing wrong with saying I'm going to be tough on crime. I think that's what the public expects of a prosecutor. Um, 
the state bar allegations that they found uh, there were several statements once again that mr nifong made that had he made them in the context of a courtroom not an extrajudicial proceeding i.e a press conference they would have been permissible for the state bar to say that he can't go out and talk about the results of lab testing in a press conference and that being inappropriate they're completely right had there been a bond hearing where he had a legitimate purpose to protect the safety of the public and to keep defendants in jail and thus release the lab results that's a proper context he didn't do that I don't see any difference. Oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you go ahead? Because you can I don't see any difference between saying, um, you know, environmental crime is going to be the number one priority in my office, or you know, child sexual abuse is going to be the number one priority in my office, which you hear DAs say all the time, uh, and having an elected DA say, "I find this conduct appalling, and that's why I am going to be the one prosecuting this case, and I am going to take direct responsibility for it myself." I just, I think that the word "I find this case appalling" has to be protected by the First Amendment, if the First Amendment means anything. Well, look, I think everything we're talking about here has to acknowledge the fact that there's a subtext in everything that that a prosecutor says publicly, because it really, I mean, you can take these statements. And, and you, everyone listens to what Naifeng, what anybody says, and in your mind you say, what he really means is so on and so on and so forth. And the problem I think that, 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 that Marsha, you're expressing and the Bill you're reacting to is when Naifeng says, I find this conduct appalling, I find this case appalling, what we're really hearing is he's sending a silent coded message of these guys did this and therefore it's appalling, as opposed to just the general if this happened, it's terrible, it's, it's bad. And that's why, again, it's, it's, it's even, even the statement, you know, I guess where you stand depends on where you sit, but even the statement, as a DA, I'm going to be tough on crime. There are people who take that and have taken it for years because it has meant for years, I'm going to be tougher on African Americans. Depending upon the context, depending upon what else is being said in an election, depending upon what other issues are brought out there. So there are times when, when these statements need further explanation because on the surface they say one thing, but people really hear something else and it's, it's informed completely by their environment and often their history. I mean, one of the points that Professor Cassidy makes is that the, the Gentile case doesn't help us very much in answering what happened. I think there's no doubt about that. In Gentile, we had a defense attorney who uh, had a client, came in late in the day, there had been all kinds of prior newspaper articles and television articles, uh, felt the need to reply. Had a client, as, as Dom Gentile said, I was, it's the first time I've ever done it, because it's kind of one of the first times I had a client who I knew was innocent. Uh, but that was maybe a different point. But you, had, you really had to kind of counteract what was already out there. And in some ways, I think it's very un uh, perhaps unfortunate that we have a rule that sort of fits both defense lawyers who are in very different circumstances than prosecutors. Now, the, the rule now has a post-genteel of a specific set of prohibitions for prosecutors. But, you know, I have this question about the rule that, you know, that, that's being applied both to Nifong and in general. Is that rule, does it provide sufficient guidance? Does it hit the right points as you look at Rule 3.6, is it, or should we split it up? Should we be looking at a rule that applies to defense lawyers who often are in this kind of responsive mode? And a, and a particular question about that is, uh, well, no, let me just ask that. Does, is this, do, do the prosecutors of the world have a, a good common understanding of what's okay to say and what's not okay to say? Is the current rule the right rule? Or have we maybe learned something that we can do to rewrite it? Maybe split it off, make it just for prosecutors. Because it's a very different game that defense lawyers have to be playing with the media than what prosecutors are playing with the media. Anybody want to tackle that question? Well, I, th spe I think federal prosecutors, and this is really the only uh, um, group I can speak uh, to, but I think they do understand the rules. And uh, the United States Attorney's Manual goes further than Rule 3.6 and 3.8, and it says that you have to take particular care to avoid making any statements that would uh, potentially prejudice uh, a proceeding. And, and my experience is that we abide by that rule. And I'm sure there's people in the audience who have a different experience, but I, that is just my experience. I'm astounded when I hear these stories of leaks. And in fact, one thing I will say is I've seen this firsthand, you know, where, where the newspaper purports to uh, disclose a leak, and, and it's, it's just wrong, factually. I've actually had cases where, you know, I was, not me personally, but the government was accused of leaking information because the Philadelphia Daily News reported DNA was found in a car. Well, DNA wasn't found in the car. The leak didn't come from the government. It wasn't true. 
and we were in the middle of an investigation, and because we're limited by the rules, we didn't correct the record. We sat silent. Um, but the, the leak was coming from somewhere else, uh, certainly not the government. I've seen lots of cases where the government gets accused of leaking stuff, and it's, it's just, it's not the source. Um, and that is one thing. I, I'm a little reluctant to, to start to separate the rules, for, have a rule, one for a prosecutor and one for a defense attorney. My experience is a practical matter is the defense attorneys don't have to play by the same rule. Uh, it's not enforced. Uh, the tit for tat rule, uh, if you want to call it that, as, as, as Professor Levinson did, uh, just gives, in my opinion, in my experience, free reign uh, to the defense attorneys. I mean, I've had defendants get up and hold press conferences and say uh, post-indictment that they took a lie detector test administered by a former FBI agent and passed it, and that's the headline story. And we have to sit there and uh, not respond to that. I think that there are uh, vagaries in 3.6 that need to be addressed, and that's why I take the position that it's unfortunate in one respect that Nifong didn't appeal his discipline in this regard. Uh, I think it's very unclear under 3.6 what it means to be a matter, commenting on a matter that's already in the public record. Uh, Maryland faced that issue with the Gansler case. To my knowledge, no other state has faced it. Does that mean a public governmental record, or does it mean it's already been the comment by others? Uh, and there were certain things that Mr. Nifong said that were in the public domain. Um, he made comments about things that were in a, a, a warrant for DNA swabs. He made comments about things that had already been comment commented about by defense counsel. Uh, and so depending on which way you construe public record, that may be warranted under the rule or not warranted under the rule. Uh, the rule also lists as uh, something that's ordinarily likely to materially prejudice a proceeding, uh, identifying the witnesses. Identifying the witnesses is a presumptively off-limits category. Well, unless it's a murder, the victim of a crime is usually a witness. Um, does that mean a prosecutor can never identify the victim of a crime? If that's the case, then 98% of state and local prosecutors um, around this country are guilty of violating that crime because it's quite common to identify the victim of an attempted murder or an armed robbery or, or, or whatever. Um, but yet if a victim, if, if that prohibition includes the victim, um, those statements would be improper. So I think that there are lots of things that could be clarified clarified in the rule. And I agree uh, with Colm that I don't think a separate rule for prosecutors, although we actually have one, 3.8F, but within 3.6 is likely to satisfy constitutional scrutiny because Justice Kennedy's opinion in Gentile, to the extent that that's still good law, um, put a lot of emphasis on the fact that the prohibition was equally applied to lawyers in both criminal and civil cases and both plaintiffs and defendants. But is, isn't the question, I mean, there's, there's, you can have a separate rule for prosecutors about specific issues, but there's really a separate rule for prosecutors that's overarching, which is you have a dual responsibility to both be an advocate for the case and to try and win your case, obviously, and, 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 and vindicate your victim, but you also have a responsibility to protect the defendant throughout the proceedings, and you have a responsibility to protect the process. So in a larger sense, there's already a separate rule for prosecutors because you, you carry this other burden all the time. And I think the real question is, how do you codify that when it comes to the specific instance of what someone can and cannot say? And I think it's very difficult to do. I, I mean, as Colm noted, I mean, my experience is also in the federal system. And federal prosecutors are among the most heavily regulated lawyers um, in, the, in the system because the, the, the federal guidelines in the U.S. Attorney's Manual are much more stringent than most state bar restrictions on what prosecutors can and cannot say and what they, what they are supposed to do and not do in connection with cases. So you sort of grow up in a, in a mentality of, of automatically not speaking to the press. But again, it's the balance of how do you then carry out your responsibility to inform people and, and so on and so forth. So I think the real question is, given this, this other overarching separate rule that already exists for prosecutors, how do you make that real in the context of handling a high-profile case? And a high-profile case does bring special considerations forward because it often becomes bigger than just the case. It often becomes more important than just these defendants and this victim, and it starts tapping into 
the community feeling disaffected. It starts tapping into groups of people who feel like they've never been vindicated before. It starts tapping into some very, very deep emotional issues on both sides of the V. And that's the real challenge to me. You know, one, one right, but, oh, I just think one thing that, that hasn't been discussed yet, and I think it's gonna be pretty interesting, is you know, we now have uh, victims' rights uh, that are man, you know, that have been legislated by Congress, and the courts have not sorted out how this is gonna work, uh, but victims have a right to speak at uh, a variety of hearings and uh, some involvement in the plea process. And uh, you know, I had a, a fairly high profile case, a murder case, where the victim's family during the 18 month investigation was, had hired a lawyer and they were out speaking. And, and we were not in a position to disclose to them information during the course of the investigation because of grand jury secrecy rules. Um, we would meet with them and it was very frustrating for them because we wouldn't tell them anything. And we would suggest in as nice a way as we could that we really, you know, didn't help our case for them to be uh, essentially, uh, you know, fighting the battle publicly. Um, uh, but, you know, we didn't, have, we didn't have total control over them. And, and then, frankly, some of the things they had done early on in the investigation did help the case. Um, but I just think that's another frontier. We don't have a panel for victims, uh, you know, to speak, but, but that's on the horizon as far as I'm concerned. Let me ask one question. One of the insights I got from talking to the reporters in the Gentile case, the two people that had written most of the articles, was that uh, they thought having Dom Gentile sort of have his press conference was one as fun. They enjoyed it. Uh, they're always looking for copy. I mean, they're, they're kind of the, the, as somebody once put, uh, they're uh, kind of, you know, they're the hungry dog and you got to feed them every day. And if they're, you feed them a little bit, they're happy. But they made this point that I thought, you know, that I, I'm sure you think about all the time, but I hadn't reflected on this. You know, we have so many law enforcement sources. I can talk to the cops. I mean, these, these were crime beat guys uh, doing it for a long time. They can pick up the phone and talk to some sergeant, and, and the sergeant can say, well, I don't know, but I've heard from somebody, and you, know, you might want to ask this person. Now, they got lots of sources. And you know, there is this law enforcement sort of institution. You guys are at the top of it or on the side of it or however you want to think about the chain of command, but that's kind of the question. You know, how do you control? How can you control? Should you control under the ethics rules what the police officers are saying, what informally and formally? In the Gentile case, there were a series of three or four uh, formal press conferences that the sheriff of Clark County had given because it involved uh, uh, theft of, of police cocaine and money that was being used in a sting operation. Uh, that's a little unusual, but that, that was the context of that case. So there's so many opportunities. You don't have to say something, but people who are in a sense, from my perspective, working for you or working with you are saying things. And ethically, that, that kind of hit, hits me as as problematic. How do you deal with that in the real world? Uh, is it a problem? You know, the defense lawyers who were here would be saying, you guys have so many sources of access to those, to the media. Reactions on any of those? I'm not sure there's a question there, but there's a, there's a context that you can respond to. Well, actually, I think it, it ties in well with a comment someone made on the previous panel, which was of the defense counsel talking about the Ramsey case and the series of leaks that came from law enforcement there, too. And I think that there, there is this perception that the prosecutors sort of control the agents and, and cops working for you. And you, you do in an investigative sense in terms of the investigative tools that you dole out, but the reality is you really, you really don't. Um, and there's, there's no remedy that, I, that I'm currently focusing on that um, short of disciplinary proceedings against them that you have when the investigative team with whom you are working chooses to leak information. And it does happen. It, it happens, and when it has happened in cases of mine, it's never been a plan of the prosecutors to get information out there or to do something or to, uh, to put information uh, before the public. Because look, the real reason that people get information in front of the press, it is to influence the jury pool. It is to establish a viewpoint about either their client or the case or, you know, to get, to, to get their point of view there. And so as a prosecutor, you have to be very careful about that. And so it's never been something that I have sought, but it has happened in cases. And it may lead to a leak investigation. It may lead to a, a separate investigation of the agents with whom you are working, which, believe me, makes your job tremendously fun after that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it may lead to formal proceedings 
against these, uh, these agents or these officers. In many instances, uh, in DOJ, it's called the Office of Professional Responsibility, may, lead, may bring an investigation, but rarely is there ever a resolution to a leak investigation. So what you have is these this general feelings of inchoate suspicion now floating on the squad, um, which 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 seriously compound seriously ne puts a negative influence on your working relationship. So it's it's never something you want as a prosecutor for the law enforcement sources to start leaking. I think if it does happen, you gotta step back and figure out all right, where is the frustration within this team that this part of the team feels they've got to take this, this matter into their own hands and take these steps and deal with it internally if you can. I think step one is having a good working relationship between the district attorney's office and the police department. They don't work for us. We can't give them orders about what they can say and not say. But if they respect you and you explain to them the consequences of the leaks, I think that you, that you have an opportunity to prevent it. In Mecklenburg County, we really don't have that issue with leaks, um, not on a big basis. When we have a high publicity case, we've done some things to, to prevent that from happening. Usually your lead detectives are not going to be the ones doing that. It's going to be people that are the fringe people around the case. Um, there's a system called KB Cops where police can access all the police reports. In the high publicity cases, what we've done is we've gone in and blocked patrol officers and other investigators abilities to pull up those police reports within my office and a high publicity case I keep those files somewhere where other people in my office can't see them um, in locked rooms or in file cabinets that are locked so that people can't get to them um, when I meet with victims families one of the first things I tell them is that I cannot disseminate information to you if I know or have a, a, a reason to believe you're going to disseminate them to the press so if I see you giving press conferences do not expect me to update you on the status of your case I will not share information with you if you want that free flow of information then you're going to have to trust me and let me try my case and then after the case is over you can say whatever you want uh, a couple things, I guess. One is, and I, th I think you have the same experience I do, which is, uh, as a prosecutor, I don't want to try the case in the media, and there's lots of reasons. I mean, you know, one is to, because to protect the integrity of the process, be fair to the, the accused. Um, but I also don't think it's good for my case. Uh, things change. You may start out an investigation. Uh, I mean, in my case, one immediately comes to mind. Uh, it was a murder case without a body. We were thought when we started the investigation, we probably had a manslaughter, passion murder. Turns out we had a first degree premeditated murder that had been planned for months. Uh, and so, you know, if you go into the investigation thinking you know all the answers and you, if you wanted to leak stuff, you know, to try to uh, gather other pieces of the puzzle to make that complete picture that's in your brain when you start, I think you're hindering yourself. You're going to hurt yourself. So I don't like to, to have the case out in the public as a general rule. Um, secondly, uh, I, I do think cops and agents uh, they like to talk. I mean, uh, we don't make, you know, in law enforcement, we say we don't make a lot of money, um, you know, so we don't live in the really nice houses, we don't drive the really nice cars, but we have the scoop. I mean, that's why, you know, you, you hang out in a bar with cops and agents and prosecutors and, you know, a lot of gossip going around. So what we've done in high-profile cases, again, where we don't want the, um, uh, the, any disclosures, is um, we, we grand jury the case. You know, now the agents and the police officers have to sign uh, letters under Rule 6E. Now you can say to the cop and his supervisor, it's a criminal violation if you leak this material. And I have found that to, to really help. Um, um, so, I, but I, I do, I guess I would just leave it with, with you know, I, I've been a lot of talk here as if, uh, um, Government prosecutors love to try their cases in the media. That that I don't I don't think good prosecutors or smart prosecutors, let alone their ethics, uh, really want to do that. Um, well, couple couple points on on what you can do. I think it depends on the setup of your office. I, I agree with everything that's been said that that leaks are not 99 times out of 100. The pro leaks hurt the prosecutor. Um, they hurt the prosecutor because you're proof might deviate from whatever was said in the leak. Um, you might get 
um, wacko is taking responsibility for the crime and knowing more facts and therefore being able to take responsibility for a crime that they didn't commit, and that happens a lot, you may get copycats. Um, so it really comp can complicate things for prosecutors. Uh, when I was the chief uh, prosecutor in the Massachusetts Attorney General's office, uh, I was fortunate that state police were assigned to our office, and it was considered a plum assignment in Massachusetts to be assigned to that office, and they were assigned at the discretion of the Attorney General. So if I suspected somebody of leaking, they were out of the office. Uh, and what I did was I'd call people in, and I'd talk to them about the case, and then you know, granted that takes time, you're right that, about that, Loretta, but there's no process that's required, at least for a, a change in status of a policeman. He can be back on the road writing tickets. So um, it's a little bit more difficult with district attorneys and local police departments, because there you really don't have any official hierarchical relationship. And I think that the answer there is, is to be found in the first sentence of uh, Model Rule 3.8F, that you have to take reasonable actions to train them on their responsibility. And you think of a prosecutor's duties as, as fighting crime and, and, and prosecuting cases, well, there are training responsibilities too. And you're just going to have to send somebody out to the DAs, to the police officers, uh, to do in-service training on these very types of issues. There's one other thing I just add on the federal level, and, and not that it works perfectly, I'd be the first to admit, but under our regulations um, and policies, the investigative agencies within the Department of Justice, including FBI, are not to issue a, a public statement without it being approved by the U.S. Attorney or the designated Assistant Attorney General. And I'm not saying that always works, um, but at least it's a policy matter, it's written there. Well, we just heard in some ways is what I, you know, it comes up in ethics class so much that, uh, oh, the ethics rules let you do this and do that, and maybe you can do that, but you really shouldn't because it's not good practice. So I'm, I'm always sort of saying that to students. That, uh, and I'm wondering here with this ethics rule, why isn't the better rule to simplify Rule 3.6 in some ways and, and really move towards no talking by lawyers about cases? Why, well, you know, in some ways, you're saying that's, you don't want to do that. You don't want to try them in the press. What's the advantage that we have? Of, of permitting any lawyers, in a sense, to open this up to the press. Uh, there's a flip side to that question, but let me—I mean, that's kind of a radical suggestion. Uh, it, it's quite contrary to Professor Cassidy, who's saying there is a great deal of First Amendment rights. But, but maybe when we sort of see what's been happening uh, since then, uh, both with defense lawyers and, and you can't respond, and, and concerns with leaks, why? why, why maybe, maybe we should go back and revisit Gentile the other way. Let's let's really keep the lawyers out of this process. Let the media do whatever they want to do. But let's not give any of the official imprimatur of lawyers, defense lawyers, or prosecutors in this process. Is that a good idea? Is that, is that a better future for us? Well, I think you have to make some public statement to be a responsible member of the executive branch. Let the taxpayers know you're actually doing something. Um, and I mean, I can also, and we do this in the department. For instance, our policy, we. We almost always say we can neither confirm nor deny the existence of an investigation. But there are some exceptions, and there might be a case of importance. In, in my state right now, uh, there have been a number of newspaper articles about abuse of patients in a psychiatric center run by the state. It's generating a lot of attention, and I think the public wants to know, is somebody in the state or federal government going to at least look into this? So that's where I don't, you know, I think it's, and uh, we, we have, for instance, made a public statement already that we have consulted with the Civil Rights Division in Washington and we're exploring that question. Um, and usually in these situations, if we do decide to initiate a formal investigation, we will make a public statement to that effect. Um, and I think we're responsible to the taxpayers, so, and, um, and we're democracy, they should know that. So I, I actually think the, the current rule is okay, and, and I do think it limits what prosecutors and defense attorneys should say. And um, for the most part, I actually think it works. Yeah, I, I think that it's difficult to, to, to say that um, lawyers, be they prosecutors or defense, who do have, who, who are officers of the court, no matter what side of the V they're on, and who do have a very public responsibility, don't also have the responsibility of providing accurate information to the press. But I would say, I would stress accurate, and I would stress, again, in a way that advances the interest that we're all talking about here throughout this entire conference, which is, uh, as Colin just mentioned, it's, I think it's very important that the public know what public prosecutors, either elected or appointed, are doing. I think it's important that they know what are the priorities of the Department of Justice. I think it's important that they know 
um, you know, where are we going to be focusing most of our resources in terms of what types of crimes are of issue? Because people have a right to weigh in on those things, and they do so. They do so through the election of DAs. They do so through their elected officials in Washington uh, trying to essentially tell the Department of Justice things that they want focused on. That happens all the time, and that you have to have that give and take. Um, so you have to have the ability to communicate and you, have, and, you, and you have the responsibility to communicate. Um, so I don't think the answer is, you know, neither side should say anything, absolutely. Um, and I think the issue is um, where a freedom like speech is, is concerned, do we want to err on the side of, of advancing that freedom or, or pushing it down? And I always err on the side of advancing the freedom. Having said that, I do think that, again, it, it, to me it comes down to responsibility. There are a lot of things that people can say the issue is, should they? You know, in, in daily life, I am stunned by what people say to me on a daily basis. So, so the, what they say in the press comes as no surprise at all. Um, and, and I will say that in, in any case I've ever tried, high profile, low profile, the press has never gotten it right. So, um, so on the one hand, you, you have this responsibility to it. On the other hand, I don't want to put too much on what the press is or is not going to say, because I do think that Sadly, they do always get it wrong, um, and maybe that's partly our fault also. I think a large part of the responsibility of prosecutors is to explain things to the press, and there are times when you cannot comment on a case publicly, but my position always was, you know, I can't tell you specifics, I can't give you anything in, before it comes out in court, but I will certainly explain to you, you know, what something means. If you're going to write a story about a particular kind of motion in a case, and you're telling me, you know, you filed a motion to do so-and-so, you know, I'll explain to you, look, this type of motion doesn't do that, it does this, because that helps you get it right. And you've got an obligation to do your job correctly as well, and that's, that's in my interest. So I don't think the answer is to shut everybody down or cut off the communication. I think the press does serve an important function in letting people know what's happening both in and out of court. Um, and so my, my vote would be, would be no to that rule. Um, do we need a special rule for prosecutors? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I think, again, it depends on the system in which you're working, whether elected or appointed, because the rules are so different in different states. Um, training, ob obviously, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think it's key both on the issues and on what to do and how to do it. Um, but I think that, uh, we're, and we all sit up here and we say, as in every panel, you know, we, we're, yes, we represent the defense of the prosecution, this is how we do things, and of course we're ethical and there are these outliers out there. Mm -hmm. The fear that we all have is that, there, is that they aren't just outliers, that's the real fear that we have, that there's more than just Nifong out there. So I think that another question, another issue for us is taking responsibility for what our brethren are doing in the field. I think um, for a lot of the reasons that have been mentioned, I think that not only would having that rule be unconstitutional, but I think it would be unwise as a, as a matter of public policy. I think that how our government condu is conducted is an important matter for citizen concern, and I think that the judicial branch is an important part of our government. So I think it's important for the public to understand the progress of cases through the criminal justice system. And while I would say that as a practical and strategic matter as a prosecutor, nine times out of ten, my, or maybe even 99 times out of 100, my, my policy would be I'm not going to have any comments about this outside of court other than describing the charges when they're issued, period. Um, there are certain cases which have, which are like the perfect storm of criminal cases in, with regards to uh, public speech. And they're the perfect storm because of high media interest and high public vulnerability. And I don't think that you can say in those cases, the prosecutor should never make a statement to the media for the reasons Loretta mentioned. I think it's consistent with your fiduciary responsibilities to explain to the public what's going on and why you're doing what you're doing. I'm thinking about a very high profile case in Massachusetts that was going on about the same time as the Mike Knife Fong matter. Uh, we spent $14 billion on a new tunnel underneath our city in Boston, and the tunnel collapsed. Uh, and the Attorney General of the State of Massachusetts uh, went on television and the public radio and said, in my view, this is a crime scene. In my view, this is a manslaughter investigation. I am investigating as a manslaughter to see who's responsible for this tunnel collapse. A woman died in the tunnel on the way to the airport. Um, I think it would have been irresponsible for the Massachusetts Attorney General to say nothing about 
his investigation of the case between the year when the woman was killed and the year when Powers Fasteners was indicted for uh, involuntary manslaughter in Massachusetts. The public was concerned about whether they could drive through the tunnel. The public was concerned about whether they were going to get its $14 billion back from public con contractors who paid for the tunnel. The public was concerned about whether other tunnels in the city might be affected by that. And I think it would have been a real disservice to the public function that prosecutors perform by taking a no comment policy. Let me, let me toss this in then, because one of the things that we kind of look back on from the lacrosse case, but also from other cases, is how do we make sure the media gets the point that innocent until proven guilty, the presumption of innocence, is important. You know, that's not expressly in the rule. I mean, could there be a, a rule that says something about you guys as prosecutors that at appropriate time, you know, you have to do Miranda warnings when you arrest somebody. Can there be the Miranda warning sort of point that in the press conference or in whatever statement, you have to say, whether they, as you say, whether they get it right and they report it right, whether that's going to make uh, 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 the news at 11 or not, we don't know. But you say, of course, as we all know, every defendant, including this defendant, is innocent until proven guilty. With that said, I have a few comments. It's, it's, how, do we, how do we get that point reinstituted as a fundamental premise of American law that the media and the people get it? Because, you know, they don't... They, they don't, they understand it at some level, but they don't want to deal with that. They, you know, we've all been wanting to get OJ convicted for a while now. Um, I'm from Buffalo, New York. He's still one of my heroes. He's a great running back, so I, I, I'll be one of his defenders today. But now everybody's kind of happy we got another chance to get at OJ. Um, and it's kind of like, well, golly, that's a weird, I don't know what went on in that room. Something very strange. But, you know, is there some way to, forget the OJ. How do we get there? How do, is, is there some way to, to do something with this approach of prosecutors to the media, given the problems with leaks, that it's your responsibility to make that point, whether it's heard or not. But you need to make it, and you need to make it all the time. But it, it is made all the time. I mean, By you? It, in, in press releases, you have to say that these are allegations only and that the defendants are innocent until proven guilty, at least under DOJ guidelines and under most state guidelines as well. And even in press conferences, you have to describe the charges as allegations only. And, and honestly, I, my, one of my frustrations as a prosecutor, it's, it's been touched on a little bit in this conference, is, and I, and I have a great respect for the press, and, 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 in many, and I say they get it wrong a lot, but they, they get it right a lot, too, and they serve a vital function. But this is real, to me, this is really an issue of press ethics, because I can't tell you how many times as a prosecutor the press will call you and try and get you to comment, knowing that you cannot. And their pitch is, you know, you should get your side of the story out there. Because I'm, with, unless you talk to me, unless you give me the real facts, I'm going to have to write a one-sided story. And my response always was, so what you're saying to me is you view it, you view it as per perfectly appropriate for you to write a one-sided story. Why is that my problem? Why is that my problem? With all due respect, it isn't. I mean, that's, that's irresponsible journalism on my part. Because honestly, I think the prosecutors do say it. Um, now, should, it be, should that bell be rung every single time? Probably so. It, sh it should be. Should it be rung loudly? Yes, it should be. But, you know, things do get reported, and there is this desire, as has been discussed here, to pick a victim, to pick a villain, to tell a story, and to have an answer. Um, and sometimes there is no answer. Sometimes you don't know what happened. You have an allegation, and you don't have a conclusion. But the press will give you one, and the press will come up with something that no one in a million years thought was ever in the case. And, and honestly, I do not know how prosecutors control that. I think the, the example of what the um, Attorney General of Massachusetts said, I, I think what he said was wrong. There's a way to communicate that to the public, which would be, we don't know what happened. Until we know what happened, we are going to investigate this case. We are going to preserve the evidence at the scene. And my, my position as a government official, if I, if I find evidence of criminal negligence, then I will pursue that investigation and consider my prosecutorial options. I think you can, can excuse me, communicate to the public that you're looking into it and that you're going to be responsible as an elected official without commenting on it's already a crime when he didn't know if it was a crime at that point. Um, I don't think I have very much to add, frankly. I just agree with the first two comments. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I know these two. I mean, sorry, I'm speaking to two different points, and uh, I'm agreeing with both of them. 
I, I think it's interesting that there are, it is already in Rule 3.6, uh, Tom. Comment 5 says that a prosecutor shall not state that charges have been filed without also stating that the defendant is presumed to be innocent. Um, it's, it's, I think I agree with you that it's widely under-enforced, but, it, but, but it's there. Uh, and, and what can get prosecutors to pay attention to it? Well, I'd say a few $30 million defamation suits might Wait, make state prosecutors sit up and pay attention. And if there's a big settlement with the Duke La lacrosse players and the city of Durham has to pay, I think other prosecutors might be more cautious in, in following that op obligation in the future. Mr. Nifong was a state employee, not a city of Durham oh, okay. employee. Exactly. <laughs> As a citizen of Durham, I... Uh, we you know, one thing I guess I will say with the premise of the question, though, is that people believe what they read. And this has been alluded to by some prior pa panelists. And I'll... Again, my experience even, I mean, uh, in high-profile cases for Delaware, of course, are nothing compared to, like, the Nifon situation. But, you know, you go in and you start interviewing the veneer, and you think a case that's, you know, on the front page every day for the last three months, they're going to know everything about it, and they're amazingly ignorant about it. <laughs> and they have not made up their minds. Well, actually, and, well, that, and that was one question I was going to ask, because we, we worried about the material prejudice, you know, the administration of justice. W what is it that we're worrying about? Was it just the juries? And, in fact, is that a problem? I mean... Is, is it a, a real problem at which time that we should go rule the other way? Why are we, you know, people say whatever the hell you want? Well, look what happened to OJ. I mean, you know, say he got off. So that's... Uh, so is it ever a real problem? Well, I don't know. I can't say if it's never, but, but it hasn't been, in my experience, to be as much a problem as you would be led to believe by conferences like this. I mean, I think it's a great conference, by the way. Just, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, I, and I, I do. I mean, I just, I don't, I think we should worry about it. But I don't know as a practical matter, is it a big a problem? It's and the other thing I'll say is, is, one, is, you know, I don't think agents or cops or the bad apple prosecutors leak to pollute the veneer. That's not my experience. They leak because of the arrogance that they know stuff and they think their they'll read their name in the paper or their institution's name in the paper. I don't think they really believe they can influence the veneer. Yeah, I... I I, would, I disagree a little bit with, with that point in terms of, of sometimes, I think, insert, it depends on the media market, I think. I think it's an issue. I think it's hard to say how big a problem it is, because certainly we, we've had a number of cases in New York where because of the nature of the case and the type of publicity that it generates in advance, and again, like the, like the Duke Lacrosse case, these are cases where, where usually where race is a factor, where class may be a factor, where government agents may be a factor, where, where you know, police misconduct cases in particular, civil rights cases in particular. Um, and so you end up using a lot of jury questionnaires to see how the jurors do feel about that. And you have to pull in a very, very large jury pool for that. And you do end up eliminating a lot of people who say they have a view about the case from the press. And then when they write out on the questionnaire what their view of the case is, it's of course completely wrong um, in terms of the facts of the case because people don't remember. The f it's someone else's life, it happened a long time ago, they read it, they saw it, and they moved on. But they do remember it to the degree that it does disqualify them from the veneer pool. It's, you really, it's hard to, to see if you can go back and say, well, had there not been press, would this person have been a qualified juror anyway? It's just hard to say. But, but, but it, does, it does have an impact. And I will just one anecdote uh, about that. And when we were prosecuting the Luima case, which was a case where a Haitian immigrant had been brutalized by the police, we had a questionnaire. And then shortly before the trial, another African immigrant was shot by the police. And at least two people wrote in the jury questionnaire, poor Mr. Luima brutalized by the police, and then they went and shot him 41 times. And you would sit there and you would think, what, what do people read? You know, <laughs> where, do they, where do they get this from? But it does have an impact on people. It has an impact on how they perceive law enforcement, whether they perceive law enforcement as credible or not credible. It has an impact on how they perceive the prosecutors or the defense. And those are the things that you sort of smoke out in these processes that um, they, 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 will, they will write. You know, I saw so-and-so defense lawyer on TV, and he'll say anything for his client. Well, obviously, you want to find that out. You know, you, you need to know that. So I think it's hard to say the actual impact, but I think it does, I think the publicity does have an impact of sorts on these types of cases. I think there's one other concern, and that is that during jury veneer, a, a prospective juror might answer the question, no, I haven't read or seen anything about the case, and then 
remember as the case unfolds and they're in the jury room that, oh, in fact, I did. And so one of the things that's underlying Rule 3.6, I think, is that we accept that the jury impanelment is an imperfect system. And, and there are many states, Massachusetts included, where lawyers are not allowed to ask any questions or submit any written questions during impanelment. And the only question that gets asked is, have you read uh, or seen anything about this case? And I think that in states like that, the likelihood of imperfection is even greater. We have a lot of uh, talented, interesting, and uh, interested people in the audience. So I'd like to, we have about 15 minutes left. I want to make sure if there's any questions from the group, please. And I, I will probably restate the question so that it ends up on whatever's recording this for, please. This question comes from a layman, so it has to be out of bounds. Do you all know if a group of scholars uh, high all attorneys are reviewing this case, the not one situation, there were high attorneys on the defense side. But is anybody review, reviewing this to balance it, to say errors and so forth and so on? I'm, uh, your article included. For, for example, what about the errors other folk committed other than that part? Take the attorney general who dismissed the case and running for governor. What kind of dismissal is that? Who running for governor in North Carolina wants to offend Duke University? I'm talking about subjectivism. Well, there's, I People think there's... People accused mm -hmm. of doing this because you were running for office. What was the attorney general thinking about who was running for attorney general when he said the cases are innocent? In other words, what about the errors other folk committed than not for I think, okay, so the question is, uh, other people, we've got uh, off the police officers, they're certainly being scrutinized. We had uh, uh, a committee in, in Durham that was studying that and other questions about other officers. But Roy Cooper is a, pro is a prosecutor, attorney general. How do, are there other lessons from other lawyers in this case that we should be looking at? It, it could I add one more? Well, let me, let me, let's take that one first, if that's okay. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, we're, we're short of time. No, no. Are uh, women less willing to come forward now? since this case as before. I think those are the things of a high panel of the review. That's a, I'll include that question as well. One reason that prosecutors should be permitted to make statements, to be ag aggressive with the media, is to, in a sense, give confidence to the public that their claims as victims will be treated appropriately. Comments? Well, I... <laughs> I think it's highly extraordinary for a prosecutor in dismissing a case to say that somebody's innocent. I think it's not only highly extraordinary, but I think it's in some respects disrespectful to the victim. I, so to, if that's the thread of, of your comment, I agree with that. It may be that these young men were innocent, but um, it, 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 there was no victim. the alleged victim. Um, um, I, I, I think that in terms of are there, is there anything, anybody else scrutinizing this, I think that one of the things we have to ask is, is it a good idea for prosecutors to be elected or would it be better if they were appointed and subject to removal? I, I guess that's at the heart of your question. Does, put, does making prosecutors run for election put too much pressure on them, either the DA or the Attorney General, um, that, that we don't want that system of law enforcement? Let me focus on that question and ask some of the others who are prosecutors because uh, the, the moment and, and certainly the uh, defendants in the lacrosse case said that was something they needed and wanted and was the most refreshing when the I word was used. Uh, in a sense, the question I asked before was, should there be something very express in the rules about the presumption of innocence? Uh, when we deal with actual innocence, is that unethical for a prosecutor, as, as, as suggested, not necessarily stated by Pro uh, Professor Cassidy? What about that? What about when you review something and it turns out that your evidence shows that there is not not, not a case that you can prosecute, but in fact, the prosecute something else. Was Attorney General Cooper right, ethically, in stating innocence in this case? Well, I, I don't even know this, I mean, the, what the regulations are, but if I had a case uh, and, and I was shown evidence at post-indictment that the defendant was actually innocent, I would publicly state that. Now, I would not say that if a guy was acquitted, because, and, and I do think that's one of the, you know, it's funny, we're talking about it being unfair for people to be tried in the media. But, you know, there could be cases where an injustice occurs within the judicial system, and then we want the media to disclose to the public that injustice. 
that the system may have uh, cost. So, um, but if I had it, absolutely, I, I mean, and, and in fact, I feel so strongly about it, that's why I'm saying I'm not even looking at the rule. I think you are morally obligated as a prosecutor at that point to declare the person's innocence if you've already said that they're, um, you know, they're guilty. I think at that, I, my answer to that would depend on whether there was, uh, there was uncontradicted evidence of actual innocence or there was evidence that could go both ways well, and you just I'm and you assuming just I've, I'm, if I'm it's saying, uncontroverted and right. uncontrovertible I would agree with Colin but that, that that's just an infrequent experience never been in my right. experience uh, Professor Tiger uh, Mr. Cassidy I, uh, as a First Amendment major I think you Well, that's an excellent question. I don't work for the Attorney General's office. I haven't for 10 years, so I can't speak for the Massachusetts Attorney General. I, when I worked for them, it was 10 years ago. But that's an excellent question. Is it incumbent upon prosecutors to see that the voir dire system is, is fairer and more accurate? Well, that, that really is the question. Yeah. I didn't think you could get the job done, but I just want to put you Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I believe in, in limited law and, and well-conducted lawyer voir dire. Yes. Um, I'm wondering to what degree, and I, I, I'm kind of curious what the traditional press thinks of this as well, but to what degree there is a crisis in confidence in the grand jury system? Because if you look at the last several years, that's where a lot of the first amendment issues are going, that's where a lot of um, leaks or not leaks are happening that are in high profile cases. So if you guys would comment, um, Home, you, you said, you know, I'll just grand jury this, and that'll get the FBI to shut up. But, um, <laughs> but, but to some degree, that's exactly what the press distrusts. This, this black box where, you know, where there are ways, you know, there's, there's the, the witnesses before the grand jury who can come out and say anything, but uh, you don't see what else is going on in that black box. Well, it's incredibly frustrating as a prosecutor. When I, I, as you know, I was an assistant U.S. attorney for many years, and then as U.S. attorney, I get to do the orientation for the grand jurors, and I tell them that you are going to in inevitably, during your 18 months of service, you're going to read something in the newspaper which purports to say what occurred in this room, and it didn't, and you can't say anything. And as frustrating it is as a grand juror, imagine as a prosecutor when they are maybe attacking you or, you know, and, and making claims that uh, somebody went in and fully cooperated and they took the Fifth Amendment. And you have to sit mum as a prosecutor. I've had a situation where three witnesses wrote an op-ed piece to the newspaper and declared how, in, in this article, how they were abused, you know, within the grand jury room and, and had very specific things. And, you know, and we just sat silent. Um, but I think that the grand jury system does work. I think it's a great system. Um, and I think it works largely because of the secrecy provisions. I think it actually, the secrecy does more to protect innocent people who could be wrongfully accused, um, and I think that outweighs, you know, any, any interest the press may have. All right, we have a couple of minutes. I thought we maybe have any final points, and I guess this question that sort of we have, we've been dancing around a little bit is, is what really is the relationship between the prosecutor and the media? Friend, foe, something you're scared of, something you, you can play, something you, whatever you want to sort of fill in with that. Is, is it getting worse? I mean, what is the direction of change? Uh, in some ways, you have good, you know who they are. You're, you're kind of repeat players in that system. Uh, what is the sort of real world, apart from the ethics rules, of that relationship between your office and the media? And, and, and in a sense, what's the, what's the biggest problem that you see? We've talked about that, but I thought I'd like to hit that on the head, and we'll close on that. Anyone? I, I would just say, in my experience, it's, it's a working relationship. Um, it is um, sometimes adversarial in the sense that the press always wants more information than you can provide um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but generally, what you find is that the press that cover your courthouse uh, tend to cover the courthouse over and over again, so you get to know people, you know, their personalities, um, you know how they write, you know what they're looking for. 
um, and hopefully they get to know you and what you will and won't say. But it's, it's a working relationship like any other, um, but an arm's length one at all times, I think. And I think it has to remain that way. No matter how friendly you get, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that um, whatever you say, unless you are very, very clear, and people get burned by this all the time, making casual comments, um, to someone that they thought well, they were having a simple off-the-record conversation with, and then the reporter says, but you never told me it was off-the-record. You never said it wasn't for attribution. And so I felt that under my obligations, I could use it. And all it takes is being burned once in that way, and you, you, are, you are forever shy of them. Um, and I think it has to be a working relationship, because I think that the press does have a job to do. They have an important responsibility in, uh, in explaining the criminal justice system to people who don't understand it and explaining what's happening in, in our overall system of government to everyone. Uh, they are the eyes and ears of the public in the courthouse, um, and we have to be cognizant of that. I have always felt that with those rights come responsibilities, and I guess what I would like to see happen in a perfect world, I, I'd love to see the press get it right more often. I'd love to pick up the paper and, and, and read about a case where I sat in the courtroom and realized, oh yeah, this is what happened in court today. And I have yet to have that happen. I would, I, I think, would like that for the media to understand what the prosecutor's role is. I know, I understand what the media's role is. I understand that they have a job to do and a story to report, but I would ask them to respect my job and I would also ask them to once in a while, step back and, and remember that when they're reporting these events, these are people. The Duke lacrosse players were people. Crystal Mangum is a person. Everybody seems to have lost sight of the lives that were, have been ruined in this case, the lives that can be ruined in other cases. Um, I had a case in Charlotte that garnered a lot of publicity. Um, a father murdered his two twin daughters and um, stabbed them a total of 33 times and called 911 and told 911 operator what he had done. And those girls were not in the grave and I was in a courtroom with a media attorney who was trying to get that 911 call so he could play it over the airways and that mother could hear what had been done to her children and everybody else could hear what had been done to those children before they were even buried. And I don't think that was responsible. And I think that, that they should step back. That story can be told, and it can be told later. But um, every once in a while, just remember what we're dealing with. I think generally uh, in, my, in Delaware, we have a very good relationship with the press. My experience is that the press does try to get it right. The, the, or the uh, reporters, is my experience, try to get it right. And usually when we have a problem with the press, it's because some editor cut significant parts out of the story or gave a headline to a story which does not um, reflect what the facts are that are set forth in the story. Um, just a personal like example of that, um, I was one of the um, U.S. attorneys mentioned in one of the many lists uh, to be considered for firing. And, um, you know, and I, I found out about this and the headline on my Sunday paper in the one state white paper read, Connolly caught in Gonzales scandal. <laughs> and now I got my revenge that Sunday, or the following Sunday, when the editor of the paper, who happens to go to church where I did, um, I said, oh yeah, I want to say something to you. And uh, I had him come down to the bottom of the steps where my four kids were. And I said to him, you need to understand when you let your guys print a headline, which doesn't reflect the story. It doesn't just affect me. It affects people like these guys who have to go to school and listen to their teachers and their, their students, their fellow students, ask you know, embarrassing questions. But I will say the story was fine. And I've always been able to live with any story because I, my experience is definitely that the reporters, the line reporters, do try to get it right. Yeah, I think it's a love-hate relationship, and I think that most prosecutors approach conversations with the media with a lot of trepidation, either because they're fearful that they're going to say something that they shouldn't under rather opaque rules, or the fear that they're going to be misquoted or mischaracterized in the media. Um, but I think that the responsible prosecutor and the responsible reporter <laughs> recognize that 
citizen knowledge of what's going on in the courts of this country are an essential to a democracy. And so the key is not squelching speech, but exercising speech responsibly. And that's, that's I think, the challenge. Well, thank you very much. It was a great panel. We enjoyed it. Have a great evening. <laughs> Yeah, that was good. Thanks, Tom. Good job. For those of you joining us at the Washington Duke for dinner, drinks are at 6.30, dinner is at 7.30. For everyone else, we hope we see you tomorrow morning back here at 9. 8.30 for breakfast.